World War II. And which branch of the service? The Army. What was your highest rank? Corporal. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Can you tell me how that came about? I was in college at the time, first semester freshman at Bates College, and uh, we had choice of the Army, Navy, or Marine Corps that we could enlist in the Reserve Corps that they had on the colleges at that time. And uh, knowing that I, my stomach wouldn't take the sea, I knew the Navy was out also, that battleships were bigger targets than foxholes. Uh, I decided that I would go into the Army. I enlisted in the Enlisted Reserve Corps on December 8, 1942. With a, they told us at the time you could continue your education as long as you were in the Reserve Corps. At that time they were drafting uh, men, but the draft age at that time was 20, the minimum age, and I was 19. So I wasn't going to be drafted anyway uh, for a couple of months. But uh, we did get into the reserves, and within three weeks they called up the reserves. Even though you thought that by being in the reserves you were going to have some time to finish college? Well, I kind of thought that, but a lot of us wanted to go into the service anyway. But being under 21, you needed parental consent. And I knew my mother would never <laughs> sign it, so. So when, do you recall the date you were actually called up? Uh, yes, March 3rd, 1943. 11.30, 11.30 p.m. I reported to Devons, Fort Devons. <laughs> Last train out of Boston. Where were you living at the time? I know you were going to base. Come yeah, I was. May, but where were you from? Um, Melrose, Massachusetts. Now, when you reported to Fort Devens, where did you go from there? Uh, they sent us to uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, in the Field Artillery Training and Replacement Center. Was that for your basic training? Basic training, yes. And how long did basic training take? Three months. So it was a 90-day. Can you tell me a little bit about basic training and what it was like? Oh, yeah. This was uh, <laughs> actually being 19, or a group of us. It was broken down into a couple of sections, really. Uh, the old men, which were 24, 25, 26, that had been out of... Uh, school for a while and had been working and so forth. And then they had the young kids. A lot of us were college uh, enlisted reserve people. And I know that several of them were uh, from Bowdoin. Hannibal Hamlin's great grandson was from the University of Maine. He was in the outfit with us. Uh, the group from Bowdoin, a group from, a large group from Yale. And uh, we were young kids at that time, really, 18, 19, 20. And while we were in college, the phys ed departments were giving us a lot of physical work. So we were in pretty good shape to start with. And uh, they, as far as the basic training was concerned, after the few close order drills and uh, manual of arms and that type of thing and work on the howitzers, uh, for the most part, it was... Uh, more well, more or less just physical conditioning, getting us into shape. And for the college kids, it wasn't too bad. We were in pretty good shape to start with, but the, the old men were having a, a, tr a lot of trouble with, with the commando courses and that type of thing. But basically, they gave you, getting you ready for military duty, uh, we had to go through, well, some of the things I was thinking about, the rifle range and uh, learning how to fire a weapon how to uh, throw a hand grenade, and that, that type of thing. And the, and the one thing was the chemical warfare. They did put us through a, a building that was filled with tear gas just to prove to us that the gas masks were effective. 
and then they make you take the gas mask off and walk the length of the the building we not did. run you had to walk and of course the it showed you that the gas mask well your rifle was supposed to be your best friend but the gas mask was second best friend i guess do you recall any of your instructors from basic training pardon me do you recall any of your instructors from basic training? yes uh the captain uh battery commander was a captain sexton and uh we had two officers that were assigned to us. Uh, first lieutenant, who was battery executive officer, was, uh, I say, a young kid. I don't think he had shaved at that time. Lieutenant Menke, and he was he was good. He was a first class officer. And then they had lieutenant, a uh, second lieutenant, Kara Halius. He came from, I think, came from Providence, but uh, he was more a regular person you could talk to him and the two sergeants were, that we had were Wilson uh, no that was getting uh, Stackhouse and Williams were the two sergeants and they were they were good they they were understanding and they as long as you didn't foul up too badly they didn't bother you too much and you had the usual thing the uh, KP and guard duty and all that kind of good stuff uh, you did have to, uh, I do remember that on KP, they'd get you up at four o'clock in the morning to get the breakfast ready and so forth. And then you, uh, the one thing that was, you wanted to dodge was outside man. Because that, if you're outside man, you're out of the kitchen, which wasn't bad during the day, but you had to stay around at night and clean the stoves and, uh, all the grease that accumulated and so forth. And I might say that um, as far as KP was concerned, my second night at Fort Devens, I drew night KP, which went from six in the evening until six in the morning. And w I sat there for those 12 hours breaking eggs into a GI container. Now, how many shells got into the, the uh, scrambled eggs that morning? I don't know, but... <laughs> And uh, then we were supposed to have the next day off, but those people up there didn't realize that. So at 11 o'clock in the morning, they got us out of bed and nobody was able to sleep after six o'clock and that type of thing. And the next night I pulled guard duty. And what we were doing was walking around the stockade to make sure they had prisoners of war up there, uh, German and Italian prisoners. And we were supposed to make sure that none of them got out. Uh, and they gave us empty rifles because we didn't have, uh, we weren't checked out on the firing range, so they didn't give us any ammunition, but if anybody got out, we were supposed to have to serve their term, which might not have been a bad idea because you'd have a roof over your head and three square meals a day, but uh, that was about the extent of what happened at Fort Devons. I was only there for about 10 days. Because we did have, one of the advantages in the Enlisted Reserve Corps was that you could have a choice of your branch of service. I mean, as far as infantry, artillery, and that type of thing. And what did you choose? I didn't know. Nobody knew what to do. I knew I didn't want the Air Corps because my, my eyes weren't that good. And I knew I couldn't fly, which meant you would fight the war with a monkey wrench. Uh, so I ended up... Uh, I knew I didn't want the infantry because that was a lot of walking. And uh, so they, we figured if you had the artillery, you always had something to move the guns. So you had a truck. And uh, so I chose the field art uh, artillery and they wanted to know which branch, field or coast. Well, uh, I was at Fort Devons in March and the wind blew down from Mount Washington and it was cold. I wanted to get out of New England. And I figured that they had coast artillery battalions out on the Boston Harbor. So it would be cold out there. I wanted to get south. And I knew that the rumor had it that the two places the field artillery trained was Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And uh, they were in the south. So I figured it would be warmer. So I took the field artillery, and I got my choice. You had two or three choices. One of them had to be a combat type of thing. And uh, 
so I did choose the uh, field artillery, which was a wise choice, I think, in my... Because the field artillery was trained down at Fort Bragg? Yes, that was where we went to Fort when Bragg. When you went to uh, Fort Devens, you said that there were groups there from Bowdoin College and Harvard. Did your group go from Bates, or did you go as an individual? No, there was a group. Oh, so maybe maybe guys? 15 or 20 of us went up at, or more. Did you all stay together through the no. war, or you got split no. up? Uh, I was the only one from Bates that went to Fort Bragg. Uh -huh. A lot of them went to the Air Corps, uh, which wasn't a bad deal because they, they had their basic training in Miami. <laughs> after you finished your basic training, where did you go after Fort Bragg? Oh, that was a, well, that, that was a story in itself. Uh, we, got, we all took uh, the uh, test for officers candidate school. And you had to have an IQ of, I think, 110 or better to be qualified. And most of the college kids would, would have that. And that IQ, I don't know, that came in the Army te IQ test that they, I forgot now what the name of it was. But uh, it wasn't too difficult. And we all figured we had the interview at Fort Bragg. And it was a simple interview. You just told what you'd been doing and how you trained and that type of thing. A little bit of first aid. Well, uh, we all figured we are going to OCS, Officer Candidate School. Well, the first sergeant came in and handed us a, one called us a, a group of us in and handed us, oh, I don't know, four or five sheets of paper and said, sign it. And we, what is it? And he says, OCS. So we signed it. And about a week later, the names were on the uh, bulletin board to report uh, that we were all going to be assigned to ASTP. Now they said, what's ASTP? An Army Specialized Training Program. Now what that was, was that if you'd finished basic training and had less than two years of college, they'd send you back to college and for more training. Well, that's the last thing some of us wanted because for the first time since we were in the sixth grade, we didn't have homework. Now they're gonna send you back to college and uh, Nobody knew just what it was. Well, anyway, we, we went from Fort Bragg to the uh, North Carolina State in Raleigh. And that's what they called the STAR unit, and that's what a classification. And we'd ask the officers and the non-coms, yeah, there are a few of them, uh, what, you know, uh, ASTP was. Well, it was supposed to be divided into two groups. Uh, foreign language and engineering. Well, I was never strong in the math and sciences, so I knew that I'd be a square peg in a round hole uh, with the engineers. And uh, so I said, I'd take, I'll go the foreign language, which I found out later was to be the uh, espionage and drop behind lines and so forth. And you were supposed to be able to speak a, a second language. Well, I'd had three years of French in high school and a semester at college, and I figured, well, you can bluff your way through it. It's going to be a written test. Or, uh, so I said, I'll take the, the foreign language. Now they took us in for an interview, and I thought the interview would be uh, a reading test or a writing test. They didn't, in those days, they didn't teach you to speak the language. You re could read it or write it and so forth. So I figured, well, I can bluff my way through this. And I went in to report and individually in either the German, the French, or the Italian, and so forth. Well, I went in and sitting behind the desk was a major in the uh, French army. And, he, and I, I froze. The only thing I could think of was say, comment allez-vous. <laughs> he said, send them to the damn engineers. <laughs> so I ended up in the engineers. Well, what happened from there was that they would assign you to different colleges across the country. And when uh, uh, we figured, you know, the swamps of Louisiana, the wilds of Washington State or Oregon and so forth, uh, the Army never sends you within a thousand miles of your home. 
So they called, they finally, after about a week of uh, doing nothing, really, it was a nice duty because you just sat in the dorm and uh, played cards, read and wrote letters and so forth. Well, anyway, we, uh, they were going to assign us, and they had us alphabetically. They called off the names alphabetically, A to G. And where were that group going? They were going to the University of Connecticut which would have been, you know, within a hundred miles of home, which was something that you, you dreamed about. But then they st and then I said, well, we've, we missed that. The next shipment's going to be to Louisiana or someplace down the swamps. And they read the names from A down, the rest of the names through the alphabet, uh, uh, from G down. And then they, there was a hesitation, and where are they sending you? Boston University. And... You couldn't believe it. The army couldn't goof up that badly. Here I was within eight miles of home, and there was several of us that were, well, two of us, three of us from Melrose, and one from uh, Wakefield, and so forth. So, so we you were. You got to go to Boston University. We went to BU. Uh, they drove. They took us up because it takes three in those days troop trains to go from Raleigh, North Carolina, to. Uh, uh, Boston would take about three days because they go ahead five miles and back ten miles and so forth and, and the cars we were in were dirty dusty and they took care of our class A uniforms that we were in for a while but anyway we ended up in Boston in what was then the old mechanics hall down on Huntington Avenue and it ended up with about 800 men in two rooms which meant that uh, they couldn't keep track of you too, too, too carefully. Uh, and we went there, and it was supposed to be for nine months, three sections uh, of three months each, nine months. And then if you uh, passed that high enough, they'd send you for three more sections, another nine months, to advanced engineering. Well, that's looking in the future, for, you know, for nine months. Well, the reason they had the ASTP, as I understand it, was that they had no place for us. They had all these soldiers coming out of basic training. England was saturated with troops at that time. Uh, they had just started the North African campaign, and they did need some troops, but not that many. And the campaign was going pretty well. So when they ended up, we uh, uh, just didn't, uh, they figured the easiest thing out was the colleges were short of men, send them to co back to college for a while. Well, the, everything went fine at BU. The first group, the first section, went from, uh, I guess, July 1st until September. No, this was uh, 1943 or 44? 43. Uh, for the first three months. And that was a snap because most of the courses they, they had were, well, the college math was what we'd had our freshman year at, at college, or some of it was more or less high school math. And the chemistry and physics were high school stuff. English, all you did there was learn how to write army letters and I, I was always strong in history, so I had no problem with history and geography. And so we went there for three months, and we had pretty much, didn't have to do too much studying because, and we had the run of Boston, pretty much. You, you were supposed to be studying, but you could just walk out of the dorm, and there was nobody, it wasn't a dorm, it was a mechanics hall. That's where the government center is now. So we had, the run of the city, really. And then uh, the second group started in uh, September, October, and that went through uh, till Christmas. Now things were getting a little more difficult. Uh, you were getting into some of the advanced math and so forth, and advanced math, chemistry, and physics, but we, could, we survived. And then the third section came until uh, sometime in the end of March, from Christmas to March. 
and that many of us were a lost cause then. That they were into advanced calculus and all that kind of. Thing. But uh, slowly but surely they were dwindling, and uh, then we were f trying to figure out who was going to advance. They were supposed to send you to MIT. Nobody went. They finally decided they needed men. Now this was in the fall, of, uh, spring of '44. And D-Day was in June, so they figured they were going to need men. So they, uh, one thing I might say when I was at BU, they, we got a new uh, lieutenant colonel came in sometime during the summer. And he was uh, an old World War I veteran and tough. Uh, but I found out that uh, he was a graduate of I don't know in those days whether it was Stores Agricultural College or Connecticut Aggies. And my father had been down in Connecticut Aggies, had graduated from there, and they were classmates. But I didn't want the colonel to find this out. You know, if you stay in the back ranks, you're sometimes better off. And everything went along fine until I was home one weekend on pass and I came down with some kind of a viral infection and I was probably some of the food they fed us. and. Uh, I was sick. I, I just couldn't leave. I said, no way I'm going back. To... So my father at that time thought that maybe they were still shooting soldiers for being AWOL. So he, he called the colonel and identified himself, and the colonel automatically, immediately gave me a five-day pass, which was great because I got better the next day. It was cleared up. He said the infirmary was full because there were a lot of them came down with the same malady that I had. And uh, we ended up in, uh, after three or four days, and then my mother got concerned that I was better, I should be back on duty and so forth. So uh, instead of lollygagging around home, I went back and reported. Well, from then on, the colonel knew who I was. And I ended up as cadet battery, a cadet a company commander for a week, and then battalion commander. It's supposed to be an honor, but that meant you had to go to all formations, and you had to take attendance in classes, and that type of thing. And you just sit down, if somebody was not there, you signed their name, hand the thing in. And a couple of the professors at BU said, will you please learn how to spell their names when you sign them? <laughs> but uh, that, that was uh, at the end of March. Everybody shipped out, and we all went down to the 78th Division, which was down in Fort uh, Camp Pickett, Virginia. And we had had no idea what it was. And I went down, and the 78th had been on 60-day maneuvers in Tennessee that winter. And they said that they were out in the field for 60 days and it rained 63 days. So they, they were a sight to behold when they came back, coming, well, two or three days in the back of a truck driving down from Tennessee. And they, they came in. With the, with what had happened was that they were, the 78th at that time was a training division, and they were sending out all the privates and PFCs to frontline outfits because they were building up for D-Day and so forth. And we were replacing the privates and PFCs. So we were about as popular as skunks in church at that time. Well, uh, they didn't know what to do with us. Here's 1,500 men or so into this one outfit, uh, one division. We ended up, uh, well, they said, you had artillery training. We, we'll put you in a heavy weapons company. That was the closest thing they had, an infantry heavy weapons company. And we were there for about a week, and then they decided they'd put us into a, an anti-tank outfit, which was 37 millimeter rifles that would useless against tanks anyway, I guess. Uh, we were in that, and then with a, in a week we ended up in the uh, and a cannon company, which was getting closer to the artillery. That was a 105 cannon rather than a howitzer. 
and and within another week they shipped us to uh, uh, a field artillery outfit. That's and that's what I ended up the 307th field field artillery, uh, battery A, and a story that went along with that was that we a group of us reported to the 307th and some new second lieutenant met us at the orderly room and put us into a, a, an empty barracks and said, stay here until somebody comes for you. This was still at Camp Pickett? Yes, that was down at Pickett. And uh, so there were about 15 of us in this barracks and nothing else, and nobody came for us. So, you know, this is pretty good duty. You just sit around the barracks all day, keep out of sight, keep out of trouble, and you could go into any of the mess halls. There were several mess halls around there, and because of so many new men coming in, they, nobody knew you, so you could eat. And at 5 or 6 o'clock at night, after the evening meal, you'd get into a Class A uniform and go to a movie or a service club or a PX and just keep out of sight. How long did you do that? It was about uh, either a week to 10 days. And we'd just sit there and play cards and write letters. And uh, finally, some, you know, it had to come to an end. <laughs> but we had been in the Army really about a year. So we, at that time, most of us knew that you didn't go looking for trouble. And as long as you did what you were told, and that's what we were told, to stay there till somebody came. And finally, somebody came for us. And then they sent us back. Well, it was on a Saturday morning. And they ended up with... Uh, uh, sending us to what happened to be a battery uh, and they needed men because a lot of the privates and PFCs that were going to be shipped out were on furlough. They gave them 10 days and uh, we, we ended up uh, going in and they were having a, a firing exercise. Uh, as, uh, they had a group of dignitaries coming down from Washington. Now Pickett was kind of close to Washington, it wasn't too far. So you always had somebody from the War Department hanging around. And they were going to fire these live ammunition over infantry. And fairly close. Well, they put all these, these new men that we were into uh, gun batteries. And most of them hadn't fired a howitzer in a, over a year. But they worked out all right. They all were assigned as one of the four gun sections, except me. And I was going to be the first sergeant's orderly for the day. And the first sergeant was, uh, he was the most miserable <laughs> person on the face of the earth. And I didn't realize it, but I was going to be stuck with him for about seven or eight months. And at the end of the, con the conclusion of the firing exercise, everybody that was on the gun crew was given a pass, and, but I was stuck around with uh, Sergeant Henshaw for uh, <laughs> the rest of the weekend. I was his gopher. And uh, so that, that was my introduction to A Battery, 307th Field Artillery. How long did you stay there? Uh, I stayed there until I was discharged. That really? was, uh, well, I, that was May of 44, and, uh, or April of 44, to January of uh, 46. Well, thereabouts. It was a, uh, right up until the time we were to ship out of Europe after the war. Uh, I was with the 307th. How long did you stay as an orderly for the sergeant? Oh, just for the one weekend. Oh. Then I try to keep away from him. That, that was... Uh... Now, did you do further artillery training while you were there? Yes, then we... What was your specific job with the artillery? Okay, what uh, we did... Uh, they uh, broke us up into four firing sections, four guns. And there's seven, there was a gunner and seven cannoneers on the, each gun. Supposedly, according to the book, you needed all eight men to fire a gun, plus a chief of section who was a sergeant. Well, th what they broke us down into, we had to learn, actually learn each position from gunner to number 
seven men. And there was no, the only way you get, could get into trouble was the gunner. And he was, uh, he had to know how to add and subtract. And if you got the wrong number on the gun, then that's when you, but the rest of it was just rote, carrying ammunition, putting what, it into the gun. What specific gun were you trained on? 105 millimeter howitzers. Can you tell me something about those? Uh, yeah, the howitzer was, uh, had a high trajectory, low muzzle, velo no, low muzzle velocity, which meant you could get behind a hill and lob the shells over the hill. And I forget now the specifics of the thing, but basically they were act accurate all from five to seven miles. But the German guns that, re, that was offsetting our 105 mil was a 88, which had a range of maybe 12 miles. And they were good, they were accurate, and uh, they were particularly effective in the, in the desert in North Africa because of the level terrain. They couldn't lob shells, they, over the over hills, they had to go more or less straight. And uh, the howitzer, the, as though, as I say, the 105s and the 155s could get behind hills and so forth and lob shells over, more or less like a mortar. But uh, we, uh, the different positions, gee, I kind of forgotten that now, but the seventh and eighth men would get the shell that they wanted, whether it would be a chemical shell or a white phosphorus, uh, high explosive, and then you'd fix a charge, you'd have five powder bags in each uh, shell, in each case, and they'd call uh, charge five, so you take the sixth and seventh bag of powder out of it and just have the five, so it would have a less range, a shorter range if you had that. And then the fuse, which would be a delayed fuse or a fuse that would, the shell would explode on, de uh, would detonate on contact. And then the number two man would load the gun and all you had to do was mi not miss the breech block when you put it in. I mean, you might have, have a, and, uh, the number one man set the elevation up and down, and the gunner set the thing, that uh, back and forth. But uh, it wasn't it wasn't too difficult to do, uh, and you uh, we got it so you could do it in the dark, really. And now, when when did you actually leave and head overseas? Uh, we went over in. Uh, I think it was. Uh, I know it was a. Middle of October in '44. Did you go as a group? Did your whole artillery yes, group yeah, go together we, because you trained together and you worked yeah, together? Yeah, we all stayed together. Uh, we went over uh, in October, well, the middle of October sometime. I think it was a 10 to 15 days crossing. We How were did in you a get over there? Uh, we were in a convoy, and our outfit. And I've forgotten it was, I guess it was the 311th Combat Team, which was uh, 3 7th Field Artillery and the 311th Infantry, was on the one ship, which was the lead ship in the convoy. And I believe the name of it was the Ericsson. Uh, it was a sister ship to the hospital ship that they had, the Kungsholm, which was originally a Swedish ship. And uh, it took us, as I say, about... Uh, 10 days to two weeks. Where did you land? We landed in uh, Southampton, and they took us from Southampton, England, to Bournemouth, which was on the coast. And there we were, we were there probably about, oh, let's see. We left uh, the, middle, the middle of November. So we were over there from the, well, maybe three weeks or four weeks in Bournemouth which was a resort town in England before the war. But there we had the first taste of that we were in an actual combat zone because you had some of the coastal defenses that was still when they were expecting England to be invaded and so forth. And occasionally you'd, uh, you'd see, not too many at that time, were these buzz bombs uh, flying over. They were headed for, for London, so... 
Can you tell me what a buzz bomb is? Uh, yeah, it was a, a rocket, really. They were firing them. It looked like a telephone pole with wings. And you could see the flame coming out of the back of it because of the rocket. And they had those that they were aiming at, at London for the most part. And they were coming out of Germany or the occupied Europe. And they uh, were not accurate. I mean, they could hit the city of London, but what they would hit in London. And there was about, I don't know, a thousand pounds of TNT in the thing. So it would, uh, and it was uh, the way they would come along that fly, you could hear them. And it sounded like a, a Model T Ford going on two cylinders. And when it stopped, then the thing would come, go down. And, that, and you're all right as long as you could hear the engine go, or hear the thing going. But when it stopped, then the, everything stopped, and you were, held your breath until you heard the explosion, and hoped it wasn't. But uh, we saw a lot of those later on in the war. And then they had the V2s that you didn't hear. Those were the original, those were the uh, beginning of the rocketry. And they'd go up how high, I don't know. You wouldn't see them. They'd just come down. And uh, they weren't as large, but they were more destructive. When you left in mid-November, where did you go? Then uh, we got on an LST. And I believe we went out of uh, Weymouth. And it was a bad, bad weather. So they held us up for a while you know, aboard the LST, which... Uh, you were cramped. Uh, you had a lot, of, a lot of men on one of those small ships and uh, it was supposed to be maybe eight or ten hours to cross the channel, but we were there for a couple of days until the weather cleared. And uh, as I recall, we didn't have any bunks to, to sleep in, but we had the trucks and the howitzers aboard with us so you could sleep in the back of the, the truck. Uh, eight men in the back of one of those trucks you kind of with all your equipment is you're kind of crowded but it was uh, uh, all right uh, and the weather was was terrible it was rainy and wet and so forth but anyway they went across and it was kind of a rough crossing although it didn't take too long a lot of the outfit the infantry uh, got off at La Havre and the artillery went up the, the Seine River to Rouen. And I know we were talking and I was sort of uh, knew a lot, some history anyway at that time. And I said that was where they burned Joan of Arc at the stake and one of the, the no, nobody seemed to be impressed. Uh, one of them wanted to know who Joan of Arc was. But uh, we got off at Rouen and Got on the trucks, we were attached to the howitzers, and oh, the howitzers were attached to the trucks, and we headed north, west, I guess. Uh, and we kept seeing the signs, and it was Paris so many kilometers, and we kept getting closer and closer, and we said, gee, maybe we're gonna get into Paris. And Paris, I guess, had been uh, liberated in August of 44, sometime in there, but it, we figured this would be a great duty to be stationed somewhere close to Paris. Well, then the signs started going the other way, uh, getting farther and farther. Well, anyway, we ended up in Belgium. And on the way up, we had Thanksgiving dinner, which was, we did have turkey, but it was canned turkey or something. And uh, rainy, I remember it was a downpour. And, Thanksgiving in those days during the war, I think, was not the last Thursday. I think it was uh, President Roosevelt decided that they'd have a longer time between Thanksgiving and Christmas for shopping or something, so he moved it up a week. So it was the third, third Thursday. So that, that could give you some time date on it. But I ate, the, I ate my turkey under the truck because... Uh, it was floating in water from the rain. And then we ended up in Belgium about that time. And it was on a, in a they called it a chateau. It was a, 
a quadrangle effect with a lot of outbuildings and so forth. And we were stationed in, in the main house. And the uh, inhabitants were down in the basement. We were in the upper floors, which they, they wanted. They preferred it that way because that was when we started seeing the buzz bombs in great number. And some of them would fall short. So they wanted to be in the cellar, in the basement. We were in the upper story. And uh, as I recall, we were on, on the third or fourth floor of the building, which meant that you had a lot of flights of stairs to climb and so forth. But also, it, it was kind of, we never realized it at the time, but we were pretty close to the front lines at, at that. And it was just before the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, so they had the privates and uh, PFCs were pulling guard duty every other night. So you, one night you're on and one night you're off. But they also had uh, a local pub was kind of close. So the off nights were not, not that bad. Uh, the, uh, we did have a run in with a battalion OD one night on the guard duty because he didn't think we were uh, where we should be and so forth. And he came running in and waving a 45. And uh, he didn't count the guard. We had four of them and where the two posts came together because you double up two men on a post. And there were three of us around a fire that we had supposedly not supposed to have a fire, but we had a fire to keep warm. But the fourth one was in a truck sleeping. And when he saw the captain, he fortunately recognized him waving a gun. He was sitting in the truck and the captain says, I've got the drop on you. And the guy that was in the truck says, and I've got the drop on you. So uh, that, that was just before we went into combat. And uh, it was miserable in there because it was muddy. And uh, I don't know, it was almost ankle deep in mud. But, uh, Did and there was you nothing know that to. You were going to go into combat? Yeah, we knew we were going into combat, but we figured that at that time the troops were moving pretty fast. There was no, they had uh, just about uh, gone through the Siegfried line, that was uh, the dragon's teeth and the pillboxes and so forth. And uh, the middle of December, I don't know the exact date, but we went up, uh, moved up into Germany. We went through Aachen, which was, there was not much left of Aachen. That was pretty much, uh, they put up a, f a lot of resistance there because it was the first major city in Germany that was captured. So the Germans did try to defend it and the buildings were pretty well knocked down and so forth. Then we went to a, little a lot of little towns, but then we pulled into the, this open field and it was, as I recall, snowing. And uh, they pulled the guns into the, this open field and they said, "Make it. this is where you're going to be for a while. And cold, miserable. And we set up the guns and they, uh, uh, the advance party that was there to show us where we were going to put the guns up said that they'd been shelling the field all afternoon, which made you feel good. Uh, but it, actually they hadn't. The, the shells had been landing a quarter of a mile in front of us someplace, and uh, they were zeroing in on a crossroad up ahead of us. Well, anyway, they, we got the guns set up, and I don't think I ever spent a more miserable night because it was because of the snow and it was half rainy and you were digging the guns in and we're digging ourselves in. And the uh, captain, we had a new captain who was uh, Captain Jones, who was very good with, with figures, but he wasn't that great with handling men. And he was young. Uh, and he wasn't a captain, and he was a first, first lieutenant. He thought he saw Germans out in front and told us to get ready for an attack. So we were lying down in the, the gun pit that we had half dug, and the executive officer came along, Lieutenant Pacinger, and said, uh, 
why aren't you digging the gun in and you know what are you doing goofing off and uh we said the captain had just told us that there was he says oh, he sees a swastika on every uh, every bush out there well anyway we got the guns partially dug in and tried to get into the hole ourselves and half of us went in and half of us stayed on the gun and tried to stay at least halfway dry we did have sleeping bags but they got wet and we got up the next morning and finished it and actually we were in that one position one's uh, outside of Lammersdorf Germany uh, from the middle of December until the end of January because we were in there about two days and that's when the Battle of the Bulge started and uh, they went just south of us and I was on as a number one man on the gun and that way you could look at the sight that they had and you could get the range of how far the shells were falling and we were firing and you could hear the tanks coming through and they kept dropping the elevation and dropping the elevation and I looked and they were about a quarter of a mile away at least that's where the shells were landing and I figured they weren't firing on our own troops so hopefully uh, we ended up uh, uh, the night and they'd gone south of us and that's where we stayed. We, the whole division held that elbow, of the northern elbow of the bulge for the, until the thing was straightened out at the end of January. And, uh, so there was fighting and you were shooting those guns every day throughout that? Yeah, but it wasn't, it wasn't constant firing, but what they would do would be, if they had something to shoot at, you know, they'd, they'd call back an enemy machine gun nest or uh, a, a counterattack was one of the things that the, they would be counterattacking and you you might have four or five rounds that you'd fire or uh, uh, well sometimes at one time they had sustained firing but uh, not more than maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Did you realize at the time what a big battle you were involved in? No, no. We knew that the, the Germans had broken through and uh, they were dropping, they were dropping paratroopers and we could hear the planes going over and also they had what, uh, an observation plane would go over every night at dusk. We used to call them Bed Check Charlie. would come over, it was uh, like one of our Piper Cubs and so forth and they'd just go, you'd hear them come over and whether they were taking pictures or not. And one of the things that we did was uh, when we were there, we were there for, oh, five or six weeks in one position, you had a chance to uh, make the thing halfway livable. And the, the, we had a dugout that was in good shape and uh, that we could stay in next to the gun and uh, you'd have four men on and four men off. Uh, every six hours you'd change. Well, uh, the uh, place became quite livable. The only problem that we were having at that time was that uh, trench foot. And I think we lost four men to trench foot in our, our section of 12 or 15. Uh, and it seemed to be that the, the younger people, the younger ones were getting the trench foot because I guess they just walked through a puddle rather than uh, around it and the feet were wet and they kept saying you had to change socks when they get wet well we had two pairs of socks so <laughs> you didn't have they were usually wet uh, I did get a touch of trench foot uh, the couple of the toes began to get black spots on them and so forth so they did have me sit down and they had captured a uh, German pillbox, which was livable, but not with damp and cold and so forth. But they had uh, like buns and burners. They, 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 you could stick your feet up close and get them warm and 
dry your socks and put them back on again. So it was only about a day that I was off duty and I was the owner. Because of the evacuation, we had uh, three of them, three of our members had been evacuated. And it was a gunner corporal, Chumko and myself were the only two that could uh, knew how to really handle a gun sight. So if I wasn't there, Mike had to do all the, the uh, gunning. He had to be on 24 hours, so I said, that's not fair. And even though I wasn't supposed to be on duty, I'd go up and work as, a, as the gunner for him. And what was Mike's last name? Chumko, C-H-O-M-P-K-O, I believe. He came from Scranton, Pennsylvania. When, when you lost those guys to Trenchfoot, did you get replacements? Yeah. Now, we, we got uh, a, a young, well, there was one, we got Eddie Sanaki came in, and he had been in the, he, he came from Chicago, little kid. But he had been in the invasion, and which we'd call it shell shock. Every time the gun went off, he'd run. And so you had to handle him with, with kid gloves, and gradually we worked him in. Mike was, Chumko was good with him. We lost a, a chief of section, Worry Wright, to Trenchfoot. So Chumko moved up and became uh, the chief of section. He got an extra stripe. And uh, then Lamort was an older man from, uh, he got trench foot, he was a gunner and was transferred out. And Sylvester Kerrigan got trench foot and he was moved out. So we were hurting for, and we had, uh, well, as I say, Eddie Sanaki came in as a replacement. Johnny Dysha came in, he was a, wasn't supposed to be over there, he's only 18 years old. And, uh, then the old man came in, Pop Kirkland. He was probably about 30, 31. And we got him because he was big. And we figured there's a, a, somebody that could carry the ammunition. And I started t questioning him a little bit when he came up on where he'd been trained. He was trained at Fort Bragg. So he had some artillery training. And I said, what battalion? And he says, the 19th. Well. The 19th Battalion at Fort Bragg, anybody that went through there at that time knew it was where they took the uh, troops in that couldn't read or write. And they tried to teach him to read or write, but Pop could, they knew we weren't too successful with Pop. He, uh, we still had to write his letters home and uh, read his letters that his wife would send to him and so forth. But he stayed with us all during the during the war, right up till uh, we shipped out, and uh, they had a yeah a couple more that came in that one of them we got rid of in a hurry, but uh, he pulled a knife on the captain, so uh, they got got him out. He was crazy, and the uh, but from then on we were pretty stable. The outfit was pretty stable. They brought in. Uh, a corporal to, repl to become a gunner. They brought him in from another section and he created a lot of problems in the outfit, but it, we got along pretty well. And we went from there until January, the end of January, and they had straightened the, uh, the bulge out. And, and the 78th attack was supposed to capture the uh, dams along the Ruhr River which uh, you had to capture the dams because they could open them up and flood the land down below so the troops couldn't go in in that area. And that was around Schmidt and Strock. And they uh, did get them, uh, I think around the 1st of February, they captured the dams. And then they crossed the Ruhr River and from then on to the, the Rhine, it was pretty open, open field, and they uh, moved fast. And we were moving, sometimes move two or three times a day. <clears throat> and you'd pull a gun into position and fire a few rounds and then 
have to latch, put the thing back together again and pull it to the next position. <clears throat> so uh, that went along for about, oh, but I was going to say two to three weeks. In the meantime, I had a, a pass to, a three-day pass to Paris and uh, a six-hour pass to Liège, which was, was great. Uh, you had concrete under your feet and civilization and so forth. We, uh, and we were going, when I was going back to uh, Paris, on a, in the, I guess we went back in trucks, I met a, a fellow, Fred Pope, who had been in high school with me. And so we were able to have somebody you knew to travel around to Paris in and so forth. And the, the uh, good food, I, I hate potatoes, but I even like them the, the way they, they cook them. But uh, other than that, we had a chance to see the Eiffel Tower and the Champs Elysees. Everything else was pretty much closed up in Paris at that time, but uh, we had a roof over your head. So. Now, as you were moving two or three times a day at some times and going forward towards the Rhine, um, where was the next combat area that you landed at? Well, the next, uh, the one that everybody hears about <laughs> was Remagen. Well, you were at the bridge at Remagen? Yeah, yeah, I was at the bridge at Remagen. Tell me about that. Uh, we uh, went into, uh, they captured the, the bridge, which we didn't know about, of course. We heard about it a week later, not a week later, but we didn't realize the importance of it, that they had the bridge. And we went along, we were on the uh, west bank of the Rhine. And the infantry had crossed the bridge. We were the first, I think, the first infantry battalion, uh, first infantry division to cross the Rhine. But uh, the infantry went across and the artillery stayed on the West Bank and fired across. And we were in a town just outside of Remagen. And there's just really not doing much other than uh, would occasionally fire a shell or two, but more or less in rest area. The uh, uh, planes were coming, or the Germans, of course, were trying to knock the bridge out, and they were throwing everything they had at it. And the planes would come in, and of course, the anti-aircraft would be firing, and we'd be, you had about 50 caliber machine guns, and every time they saw a plane, uh, they'd fire at it. Now, we put, the people on the 50 caliber machine guns, we had a couple of them on either side of the, that you couldn't trust on the howitzer, you put them on a 50 caliber machine gun. And I did say to one of them, How, do you recognize these planes? We had plane recognition, that was part of our training. Ah, no. And I said, well, how do you know what the, if they shoot at us, we shoot back at them. And that was uh, how we won the war, I sometimes wonder. But uh, that was uh, what they would do. Now, what a lot of them didn't realize was that all that ordnance going up has to come down. And we'd be, you'd be out there and pieces of shrapnel would be dropping down around you. And uh, uh, unex well, we did have a couple of unexploded shells, 37 millimeters come down in the area. One of them went down and was on the roof of the house we were staying in. But uh, they, uh, as I say, they were throwing a lot of stuff in. And one of them, we, we always thought they were uh, 240 millimeter mortars, but I don't know now whether that's what they were or some of these V2 bombs that they were shooting. They were falling short. One came kind of close to where we were. And actually, the concussion knocked me over the trail of the gun. Uh, and then we went back to see the hole that it made, not realizing that another one could be coming in, you know, but I mean, you didn't think to. Well, anyway, uh, we were, had nothing to do for a while. I was off duty and the truck driver, Charlie Morgan, and I decided we'd go down and take a look at the bridge. Well, 
we went down and saw the bridge, walked up on the bridge, and oh, let's cross it. So we crossed it, never realizing they're still shooting at it. And uh, then we got across, and then we had a railroad tunnel across the, on the east bank of the Rhine. And then we decided that was the safest place to be. And we got in the tunnel, and then we had to get back to our outfit. So we ran back across, pretty much back across the bridge. And I mean, you, as 20-year-olds, you don't think too much about some of these consequences. And then we eventually crossed the Rhine. And it was more or less a mop-up operation after that. The Germans were knew that the war was pretty much over. And instead of one or two prisoners coming in, you'd have 50 of them surrendering at a, at a time. And... Uh, were you present when they surrendered at any times? Yeah, we were up around the town of Wippetal. The division went up, to, and we were outside of Wippetal when the war ended. And, but then you uh, pulled more or less occupation duties. They'd set up checkpoints, and you would check all these displaced persons. Now, a lot of the civilians moved ahead of the troops. Now they were trying to come back home, and we were trying to catch uh, soldiers. Well, what a lot of the soldiers did were take off the uniforms, put on civilian clothes. And anybody, you'd stop them and they're coming in, and of course, we spoke very little German. Uh, you'd stop any groups coming by and you'd question them. And if you'd see men between 18 and, and 40 or so, or older and younger, uh, and civilian clothes. You figured that they were at one time in the service, so you kind of question them uh, a little more carefully. And the other thing that, that was a dead giveaway was that there was a shortage of shoes in Germany. So the soldiers wouldn't, uh, wouldn't discard their boots. They always had the... So if they had boots on, you knew they were in the army someplace. And of course, they, they did pick up some of the high brass and I know at one place I, I was on one of the outposts and stopping them and I figure I had a, a really, must have been a, an admiral or something, in a blue jacket with all kinds of gold braid on them and so forth. And I figured, gee, I got a real live one here. Come to find out he was a railroad conductor. <laughs> but you, you, what do you do with them? You, put them in a pen and hold them there for a while, but then you had to feed them. And uh, they did get a few, we never did that I know of get any high ranking officers. We got a few soldiers and so forth, but for the most part they, they didn't, the war was over and they survived. And that was... I know that you were in some other battles. I know that you were at the Herkin Forest. Yeah, that was uh, when we went in, first went into combat. Uh, we were on the edge of the forest. The 311th Infantry was in the Hurtgen Forest, and we were on the edge of it. Actually, not too much uh, in combat, but uh, they were. We had nobody in front of us uh, because the 311th was supposed to be in front of us. They were off on that flank, someplace mile, a few miles away, and. Uh, that's why if, the, if they had decided to come through our section uh, at the Battle of the Bulge, there would have been nobody to stop them. They'd have hit the artillery and the artillery couldn't s handle an infantry attack. So uh, we were fortunate. But that was, at that time, uh, and I, I couldn't tell you the divisions now, but there were the 78th and a couple of others. And they were green divisions, had not been in combat, and they just threw them in to fill in the line. And that's why they broke through so easily. It was a green division. and But they could have come through us just as well. Were there any other battles that you no. were involved with, with the artillery? No, that was just going across the Cologne Plain and 
I'm going to change gears a little bit and ask you about daily life while you were in the service. How did you stay in touch with your family when you were overseas? Uh, you could write letters. They had the uh, V-mail, which they'd take pictures of your letter. You know, you'd have one sheet of paper and that was it. Uh, but we would write, I tried to write every two or three days. That, uh, and they would take, I, as I recall, it took about a week to get the mail over and back. And in order to get packages, you had to say, send me cookies and cake and so forth. And all your relatives would send you. And the thing that we, they could send over at that time that would travel well was uh, fruitcake. We had more fruitcake coming into the division, uh, or into our section, that you would just, you'd give it away, really. You had to, I used to, like, I, I love the sardines, and they'd send me cans of sardines, which were, traveled well. Uh, I know that we had this one uh, member of our, was, he and I were pretty close to that, uh, while we were over there, Abe Eisenberg, and his folks sent him gavelta fish. And I love fish, but uh, I tried that gavelta fish, and it, it, no way. Uh, but then nobody could eat it, so Abe, Eisenberg was so close to Eisenhower, we used to call him Ike. Uh, he wrote home, send me all the gavelta fish you can get, I don't have to share it. <laughs> so, uh, we, uh, he, uh, he eventually left our uh, gun section and went up with the wire section of radio up forward. He, he was quite knowledgeable with, in those days, electronics, and uh, they, they used him up there. And he would, plus the fact that he could speak German or Yiddish, which was close enough to German so that they could get by. And he was our interpreter. For, and I said something about if he, if he got a phrase or a word or something he didn't understand what you do, he says, you just yell louder. And <laughs> they were all afraid of him. But he had lost a, a brother at, on D-Day, so he had no, no love for the enemy. So. Well, your artillery outfit was always moving, so was the mail good at catching up? Oh, yeah. We, we would get the, we, the mail was pretty good coming through. And another thing that, for the most part, if you weren't moving, if you were stationary for a day or so, you had hot meals. That was my next question. What was the food like? What did you eat? I mean, you, you didn't have mess halls out in the middle. Powdered eggs for breakfast. <laughs> uh, well, it was chalk and water, I called it, but they said it was milk. Uh, you could usually make pancakes. Uh, Spam, they cooked that up in many different ways. And the cooks could manufacture, they'd make muffins and, uh, as I say, pancakes, but nothing fancy, but you ate well. Then you had, uh, if you were moving, you had C rations and K rations. And I imagine you've heard about those before. But uh, the K rations were, came in like a Cracker Jack box. And they had three three meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I've forgotten now what each one of them was, but you'd have uh, all little round tins of, uh, well, the dinner was cheese for the most part. And you'd have uh, breakfast, I think they had sort of a, an egg combination with some kind of meat in it, ham or something, and the same thing with a dinner combination. Now, one of them I couldn't handle. It would make me sick. So I'd trade that off for the cheese or, or something else. So you, you did all right. That, and you'd get three or four crackers to go along with it and some kind of a drink. It would be, well, they had uh, Nescafe powdered coffee or something in the beginning, and it was tolerable. Then they had a lemonade 
thing for, for lunch, which we call carbolic acid, but uh, they, uh, and four cigarettes and a roll of toilet paper, a uh, package of it, and a candy bar of some, well, it was, they had, and then they had a D bar, which was chocolate. And you couldn't bite into it, you'd break your teeth on the thing. But if you cut it up and put it in a cup of water and boiled it, you could have cocoa. But the mistake you made on some of it, that there was enough nourishment in that candy bar for a whole meal. And if you ate it fast, it would upset your stomach. You had to eat it over maybe 15 or 20 minutes. And uh, as I say, it was hard, you had to bite at it cut it off and eat it in piece, small pieces. The, the uh, sea ration was well, like a stew or a hash, a can, that you, if you could, you could eat it cold or you, if you were well, stopped long enough, you could warm it up and it would be uh, tolerable. Uh, the civilians liked it. They liked all that stuff and you could trade that off with, for, uh, well, we used to get canned fruit or uh, preserved fruit, which was good, that you trade off. You weren't supposed to talk to the Germans, but that was... Uh, what would you trade? What would you get in return for it? Uh, we'd trade the uh, can of whatever, maybe K, a box of K-ration for sort of a salami that they'd have or uh, uh, beef jerky. Uh, the civilians themselves didn't have much. They, they'd have uh, preserved fruit, peaches, and uh, if you were fortunate, you could confiscate a, a live chicken once in a while and uh, do that, but no. eggs, eggs were... Real eggs? Yeah, real eggs. What were your sleeping conditions like? Were you ever stationed at any place where you had actual barracks with beds to sleep no, in? No, no, not until after the war. So we'd, the we'd be out time in the time that you were over in Europe, you were sleeping. Where would you sleep when you were out in the field? On the ground. <laughs> Usually, one of the things that you learned very early in uh, combat was that you dig and get underground. Uh, even though it might be only six inches to a foot deep. You'd have a, uh, they call them foxholes, but those would, would go down deeper. But all you had to do was a place where you could have some dirt in front of you and you could throw your bedroll down and sleep. Uh, really, did you uh, pitch a pup tent? That was statewide. One of the things that I might mention that uh, when we were in Lammersdorf in that first month, uh, according to the book, the minute you put a gun placement in a howitzer, you put a camouflage net up. Now the camouflage nets were made a lot of cloth would intermingle with uh, green and gray and so forth so that you'd hide what you had. Well, we got kind of smart one time and said, you know, we got a cover of snow and you put this green it, you spot it from the air. I mean, it, it was very visible. So we thought, using Yankee ingenuity, that we went up into the town of Lammersdorf and confiscated a lot of sheets, bed sheets, and strung those over the howitzer so it would blend in with the snow. Uh, the colonel came by and took one look at it and put up the camouflage nets. So, again, how did we win the war? But. Uh, that was uh, one of the things. So we had to have a camouflage net. And at the at, at Remagen, just after Remagen, when we were going up on the west bank uh, of the Rhine, we had the camouflage nets. We had a gun position that was supposed to be we were supposed to be more or less in a rest area. And uh, we got strafed by a, an ME 109 came down. Now our machine gunners on either side of the gun positions open fire on the plane when it came down. Well, they were firing low, and a couple of the tracers hit a net and uh, set it on fire. 
now you got a lot of loose ammunition floating around down there and this net collapsed and we did have bags of powder that were sitting around and that which ignited now they they didn't explode they just uh burn and uh it was it was a good thing it ended up as a good thing because any time you came up short of any equipment we said we lost it in the fire and uh, the uh, and I will say that we when we were crossing the channel we had two dummy rounds of ammunition in the truck and we kept banging our shins on it and so we're figuring going into combat you don't need dummy ammunition so we tossed those overboard and come to find out that somebody was going to have to pay, I don't know, $40 a piece or something for them. And uh, in those days, you got $50 a month for <laughs> pay. Uh, Did you have enough ammunition, clothing, other supplies? Yeah, we were never short of... Uh, at one time during the bulge, we were a little short of ammunition, but nothing serious uh, was getting down low. As far as clothing was concerned, we never had a problem with that. As a matter of fact, they used to, after the war, sell boots for, some of them would sell boots for $75 a pair and then claim it was lost. And, uh, okay. Did you do anything special for good luck? Uh, no, not particularly. It's, uh, that, that I can think of at this time. You know, it's 60 years. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. <laughs> How did you handle the stress of the job? Uh, the, the main thing was the monotony. You know, the same thing. You always, uh, as I often think back on it, what you remember are the good times. You block out some of the, the other. Now, I know you said you had a three-day pass to Paris and a six-day pass to Liège. Um, six-hour pass oh, to Liège. Oh, six hours? Yeah. That wasn't much time to get into trouble. No. Um, what did you do on your six hours? Drink. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you, my wife isn't around. She can't hear that. <laughs> uh, you'd walk around. Sometimes you try to buy souvenirs to send home. Uh, but in Liège, they didn't have much. That was uh, Paris, they did. But in Liège, they didn't have much. Uh, we'd buy a bottle of cognac to take back. And, uh, or whatever you could, could buy in there. And sit in a bar and drink beer or something like that. But six hours, you couldn't. Paris was a little better. You could do some sightseeing there and... Uh, Did you have any other R&R &R or leave while you were over in Europe? Oh, yeah. Uh, I got to uh, uh, Brussels. And this was after the war. That's because I went back with a, as a, an assistant truck driver and got assigned a taking leave troops back to Brussels. So you got to go in and, and I like Brussels as a city, a leave city, better than Paris really. And uh, so we could stay with the uh, troops. Funny, uh, one of the things that made you think of a frontier town, you go into Brussels and you checked in, the, the big sign, check all shooting irons. So everybody had uh, Lugas uh, captured pistols and so forth that they carried with them and you had to check them. If they caught you in town with them or in the city, they'd confiscate them. So you'd check them and you'd get picked them up on the way, way back or way out of town. But we had three days in Brussels. Actually, it ended up four days. And that again was a lot of sightseeing and uh, eating good meals. You know, they, you could sit down in a restaurant and order a... And I did have sort of a speaking knowledge of French, so I could get by with, with that. Uh, and then just before I got discharged, I had a 
seven-day pass to London. And London was a good place because uh, I had a choice of Switzerland, Nice, or the Riviera, or London. Well, London was good because you had to cross the channel, and they kind of lost track of you going across the channel, so you could stretch a seven-day pass into maybe 14 days because you had to get a ship coming back across the channel, and uh, even though your pass was up, you could hang around Southampton. And uh, but We came back, and uh, eventually, they caught up. You had to. You had to come back. So there was another one, another fellow, and I've forgotten his name now. And I were in London for the seven days. And then we hung around uh, Southampton for a while. Came back and ended up in Paris. And I figured they still didn't know where we were. So we, till our money ran out, we could maybe have three or four more days in Paris. And I saw somebody, and we were in the railroad station in Paris and I asked some, uh, one of the troops that were coming down with a division patch uh, if they, how the point system was working. Now that's how you were being discharged. You had X number of points. And I said, have they shipped out the 60 pointers yet? He says, oh yeah, he says, and they're shipping out the 56 po uh, pointers. Now I had 56 points and uh, so I said, there's no way, I'm going on the next truck back to the outfit. And I got there just in time as I was shipping them out. And uh, I think I stayed with the, uh, with the outfit maybe two or three days. And then we uh, shipped out and they went down, to, we went, and I'd forgotten it was down someplace in Germany, southern Germany. Uh, the, uh, to the 83rd Division, which was being deactivated. They were sending them back to the States, deactivating them. And uh, we went in, there were three of us from our outfit that were in the 83rd. And that was, you're just killing time. But then now, by that time, I had the, the two stripes, so I didn't have to walk guard duty. I hadn't been able to walk guard duty. I hadn't been assigned it. But now you're down in the 83rd Division and everybody had stripes. So we were pulling, we didn't pull KP because they did have German prisoners doing that, but we did pull guard duty. And uh, I remember Hank Mance and I were, they were gonna give us typhus shots. We never had typhus shots before. And we were figuring we're going down here, within a month or so, we're gonna be out of the army. Why do we have to have shots. So we tried to dodge it and they caught up with us. We had the, the typhus shot. And then they sent us down to uh, the coast of France, and down around La Havre. And we were in one of these camps. They called them all after cigarettes. I think we were in uh, Paul Mall. Uh, they had Camp Lucky Strike and so on. They were all ports of embarkation, out, uh, close. And during that time, I ended up with a toothache. And that, that's one of the vivid remember. And uh, every day at, at, down at the camp, they call off the shipments, the ones that were going to ship out, depending on whether there was a boat in or not. But uh, they didn't have any dentists in the camp, and you had to go into La Havre. Now, if you were in La Havre and they called your name for shipment, you went back down on the bottom of the list, and there might be another two weeks or a month before you chip out. So I said, I didn't do it the tooth. Uh, so I think it was uh, New Year's or Christmas that I had the tooth. It was really bothering me and I eat on one side of my mouth and so forth. Well, anyway, we finally got shipping orders and I figured, gee, if I get aboard the ship, maybe they got a dentist aboard. Uh, well, we were in the back of a truck with a canvas off and it was cold, it was in January, and suddenly uh, the cold air was hitting the, my face and I got a sharp pain and then that went away. What it was, was the nerve died in the tooth. So I had no problem with it from then on. Then we got aboard a, a Liberty ship or one of those things they put together 
for a shipment home and uh, uh, it was miserable. Uh, coming across I pulled duty and the, the guard duty on the ship of MP duty and because you had work to do there was no problem but I had nothing we had nothing to do going back and the minute we hit the English Channel and then the open sea the ship rocked and oh I was sick for about five days I said if I realized this I'd have re-enlisted and uh, they had uh, and I knew you had to get food in you but every time I got out of the bunk, now we were stacked five high in the ship. The minute I got my legs over the bunk and down on the deck, the deck would start to spin and I'd get sick again. So uh, the only thing that we had was uh, I had a box of uh, Butterfingers candy bars. And that was what I was trying to get done. To this day, I can't eat a butterfinger. Ah. Uh, but uh, after about four or five days, I was able to get down and get to the galley. And I, the, the first day, I got halfway down going into the galley, and you got that greasy odor. That, that did it. And I was, uh, the second day, I got down there, and they, I went through the, the line and they wouldn't let you leave the, the uh, mess hall with any food, so you'd have to eat it there. Well, I couldn't. I knew I couldn't get it down. But I did get uh, two or three hard-boiled eggs and stuck them in my pocket and went up on deck and ate them in the fresh air. And from then on, I was all right. But uh, it's, it was a long trip because you knew you were going home. Yeah. And it was a long trip. Roger, I'm going to take a break here and then start part two. Okay.